Exposure compensation, dynamic range, focal length, aperture, ISO, shutter speed, focus. Just way too many terms. So lately I have started covering some phones on the channel and whenever I talk about the phone's cameras, I do add a bit of extra information here and there. Like on the Redmi Note 6 Pro unboxing video, I said how a wider aperture of a lens uh, makes the final image brighter. And many of you guys responded positively to that particular piece of info. That's when I figured you guys would also be interested to see me explain all basic terms related to camera and photography in general. I promise I won't go too technical here. Everything will be put across in simple terms like the title suggests. Before we begin, let me quickly introduce myself. I'm Sundar, this is Technology Jock. Subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon if you find this video informative and useful. Let's begin with the most basic, most popular term, camera. Now, when you say camera, it's usually a combination of two things, sensor and lens. It's not just with DSLR or any professional camera, even a smartphone camera has a sensor and a lens. The difference is on a DSLR, you can change lenses for more versatility, but on smartphones, the lenses are fixed. That's why these days we are seeing multiple cameras on phones so that lenses with different capabilities are all available to use on the same device. Now the amount of light that goes through the lens and hits the sensor, it's called exposure. It's the literal meaning how much a sensor is exposed to light. That's exposure. This exposure is decided by a combination of three things, shutter speed, aperture and ISO. Shutter speed is the amount of time the sensor is exposed to light. As in, if you set it to one tenth of a second, if this is the sensor and this is the shutter, the shutter opens for one tenth of a second and then closes. So it's like, that's it. So for the moment, let's forget about aperture and ISO. Let's keep them constant and just change the shutter speed and see what kind of difference it makes. The shutter speed of this image is one thousandth of a second. This one, one five hundredth of a second. This one, one hundredth of a second. And this one, one twentieth of a second. So in broad daylight, even 1 20th of a second is too much time. So what is aperture? Aperture decides the amount of light that enters the lens in a given amount of time. Okay, do you see these blades moving inside the lens? So when they close down, the gap at the center is so small, so the amount of light entering the lens is very less. But as we increase the aperture, the blades open up and the amount of light going in increases as well. Once again, on DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, you can change the aperture. On this particular lens I'm using, the aperture can be varied from f3.5 to f16. f3.5 is the widest, f16 is the narrowest. Yep, larger the number, narrower the aperture. But on smartphones, the aperture of the lens is generally fixed. The only two exceptions are Galaxy S9 and Galaxy Note 9. Wait, there's also an Oppo phone, uh, the R17 Pro, I guess. Uh, it also has variable aperture. Uh, the two, two aperture values available are f1.5 and f2.4. Next, ISO. It's the sensitivity of the sensor. Once again, let's see how it practically works. As you increase the ISO, more amount of light is captured by the sensor. But increasing it also introduces a lot of noise. Here's a comparison of images shot at ISO 125 and ISO 3200. The images are equally bright because for the left hand side image I set the shutter speed to 1 4th of a second uh, while for the other image it's 1 60th of a second. So Sundar, if you can adjust the shutter speed and aperture to bring in more light, why do we even need ISO? Okay, the reason is, we can only adjust the other parameters to a certain extent. There are some limitations. Let me explain. We shoot 99% of the images handheld without any additional equipment uh, like a tripod or anything. And our hands tend to shake a bit. They cannot stay absolutely stable even for one second. There will be a slight shake and it will reflect in the final image. Here are a few pictures shot at one second shutter speed. Every single picture has a bit of blur due to camera shake. It's inevitable. Usually the maximum shutter speed for a blur free image is around one tenth of a second for a typical smartphone. If the lighting is good, one tenth of a second is more than enough. In fact, it's too long, but under low light, it's usually not enough. And when the aperture is also at its widest and still the image is too dark, 
like here on the OnePlus 60, shutter speed is around one tenth of a second, aperture is f1.7, still the image looks quite dark. That's when ISO comes into play. Yes, there will be noise in the image if you increase ISO, but at least the image will be usable, it won't be too dark. And camera shake is not the only limitation for long shutter speed. It also depends on what you're trying to capture. If it's a moving bus or car, then setting it to one tenth of a second will end up blurring the subject. Sometimes people intentionally increase the shutter speed to like uh, three or four seconds to capture this kind of images, light trails. So what happens here is during those three seconds, the light source travels from here to here. So the entire trail is captured. So anyway, you get it right, the relationship between aperture, shutter speed and ISO. Now, depending on the scene, you need to adjust the parameters accordingly. And guys, this is the longest video I've ever done. So much time and effort went into the making of this video. So I'd really appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button and the bell icon. I promise to make more exciting content. So next thing, OIS, optical image stabilization. Remember I said the maximum shutter speed for a blur free image is around one tenth of a second for a typical smartphone. Well, if the smartphone has OIS, then you could go higher, higher as in one uh, sixth of a second, one fourth of a second. The reason for this is OIS makes sure a dedicated motor inside the camera, the motor makes sure to compensate for minor shakes. Note the word minor. So if you're capable of getting a blur free shot at one by 10 shutter speed without OIS, then with OIS, you can probably go up to one fourth or even one third of a second, maybe even one second if your phone's OIS is really good and you manage to keep your hands super stable. So now you've completely understood the term exposure. Now I'm sure you've heard of terms underexposed and overexposed. If you don't know what they mean, hear me out. Let's pull up a picture. A typical photo should ideally have both highlights and shadows exposed properly, like this one. Wait, highlights and shadows? Okay, the brighter parts of the image are called the highlights and the darker regions are called the shadows. So in this image, these are all the highlights and these are the shadows. Here, highlights, shadows. Hope you got it. So let's pull up another photo. You see what's wrong with this image? This part, the highlights are blown out. There is no detail, nothing is visible. It's all just pure white. So we say this part of the image, the highlights are overexposed. Similarly, in this image, some parts, the shadows are way too dark, which again leads to loss of detail in those regions. So we say the shadows are underexposed. One of these issues happens when the scene you're trying to capture has a very bright object and a very dark object. Sometimes people intentionally underexpose the subject for something like a silhouette. Here's an example. So underexposing or overexposing a scene doesn't always mean it's bad exposure. If you're creative and make something cool out of it, it doesn't really matter. But typically in most scenarios, we should try to get the best out of both highlights and shadows, which brings us to the next term, dynamic range. Dynamic range is the difference between the lightest tones and the darkest tones of an image. I know a single line doesn't really explain it. Uh, so as always, we'll go deeper. Let's say a scene has these tones of light. The shadows of the scene are as dark as this and the highlights of the scene are as bright as this. A camera may not be able to capture everything perfectly. It will either overexpose a part of the highlights or underexpose a part of the shadows. Let's say a camera is capable of covering tones in this range. So the dynamic range is around 12 stops, which means the camera is actually capable of covering tones in any 12 consecutive stops. So if it's the middle 12 stops, then you lose a small part of the highlights and a small part of the shadows. You can increase the exposure and capture the shadows. So these tones will be covered, but more of the highlights will be overexposed. Similarly, if you decrease the exposure instead, then you will be able to capture more of the highlights, but the shadows will be underexposed. Here's a practical example, beautiful sunset, but the building in front looks very dark. If you want the shadows to be exposed better, shadows in this case are those buildings, just increase the exposure. Now the shadows look better, 
but a part of the sky is overexposed. If you want the shadows to be exposed even better, increase the exposure further. Looks better, but more of the sky is overexposed. Usually the dynamic range of smartphone cameras are poor. And that's why a concept called as HDR came up. HDR is nothing but high dynamic range. Almost all of our phones have the HDR feature. What it does is capture two or more images with different exposure settings and then merge them to get a nice result. So I shot these four images individually with different exposure settings. Merging them resulted in this picture. The dynamic range here is much better than any of those individual images. Like uh, these are the four individual images. Uh, on one of them, the sky is very clear, but the buildings are so dark. On one of the other images, the buildings are bright, uh, visible, but then the sky is overexposed. But look at the final image, the HDR image. It's perfect, best of all. But then this is a manual process. I shot everything separately, used Photoshop to merge it, but we all know phones can do it instantly. This is the difference between a non-HDR image and an HDR image captured using the OnePlus 6T. See, it makes so much difference. Now HDR makes things so much better, but it still doesn't mean it can capture all 20 or 21 stops in this scale. It goes up from 12 to maybe 15 or 16, but that's it. This is also an HDR image, shot using my Xiaomi Mi 6 using Google camera app. A part of the sky is overexposed, and everything inside the room looks kinda dull. I mean, everything is visible, the AC, the curtains, the window frame, but they are not perfectly exposed. Now let's say you want the sky to be perfectly exposed. Then you have to decrease the exposure. Here's the result. The sky looks perfect, but everything inside the room has become even darker. So it really boils down to what is the more important part of the image for you. If you want the sky to be perfectly exposed, just tap on the sky. Your phone will automatically set the right exposure for the sky. If you want the room to be well lit, then tap on a part of the room, then the room will be exposed better. Dynamic range is one of the most important reasons why professional people like to shoot during the golden hours. Basically the one hour after sunrise and the one hour before sunset. Because during those two hours, the sunlight is kind of soft, it's not very harsh. The highlights are not too bright and the shadows are not too dark. Now one more thing is, the HDR feature on smartphones, it completely depends on the software. It's up to the camera software to enhance the quality. Google's HDR Plus and Apple's Smart HDR are two of the best HDR implementations so far, in my opinion of course. In fact, that's the reason why so many people are installing the Google camera app on their phones. Even I have it on my Mi 6 and the OnePlus 6T. I installed it for my mom as well on her Galaxy S7 Edge. So it's crazy good. But guys, a very important note, high dynamic range doesn't always mean it's better. Look at this image. The dynamic range is quite good, but the image looks too flat, like it lacks contrast and that punchy look. Now how about this? Yes, the dynamic range takes a hit, but overall it looks more pleasing to the eye. So it's just a uh, disclaimer sort of thing. You can increase shadows and reduce highlights on Photoshop to get better dynamic range, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's better. Anyway, I think that's pretty much everything you need to know about dynamic range. Uh, sorry I took way too much time, it's because dynamic range is the most important thing in photography. Uh, the term comes up literally everywhere. So next up, focal length. It basically determines the field of view. It is the angle between the two opposite corners of an image. Here's a table with different focal length values and their respective fields of view. The primary camera on most phones have a focal length of 24 to 27 mm. On some phones, there's a secondary camera with 2x optical zoom, like the Galaxy S9 Plus, uh, iPhone XS. What's the focal length of those cameras? Easy, just two times the focal length. If it's 2x optical zoom, it's two times the focal length of the primary camera. If the primary camera has a focal length of 25 mm, then 2x optical zoom means 50 mm. Similarly, wide angle cameras have less than 25 mm focal length. On the Mate 20 Pro and the LG V40, the wide angle camera has a focal length of just 16 mm, which means the field of view is very wide, 106 degrees. The actual focal length of the lens is very low, 16 mm. 
it's just the 35 mm equivalent focal length if you don't get it just forget it it's all right that's an entirely different topic which would take another uh, 5 to 10 minutes to explain so let's move on to focus this is something i'm sure everybody already knows when someone says the subject is in focus it means it's one of the sharpest parts of an image generally the depth of field where the camera can maintain focus depends on many factors wider aperture means the depth of field is very shallow a bigger sensor also means the depth of field is shallow so since i'm using a professional camera with a big sensor to shoot this video the depth of field is quite shallow anything from here to here the camera can focus that's where my face is that's why my face is in focus but everything that's not in this field the camera cannot focus say my palm is away from the focus field so it's blurred out the background is also blurred out but if the camera shifts its focus to a closer subject for example uh wait yeah perfect my palm is now in focus but my face is blurred out but if i use my smartphone to shoot this exact video or a photo pretty much everything will be in focus because the sensor size of a smartphone camera is relatively too small so if you capture an image like this everything will be in focus but sometimes if the background is blurred out the subject will stand out it will look much better that's why portrait mode is becoming increasingly popular these days but then portrait mode is just a software feature it just detects the edges of a subject keeps it in focus and then blurs everything else it's available on almost every new smartphone the redmi note 6 pro costs just 14000 rupees has some great portrait mode features anyway back to the topic as you go closer to a subject even on a phone camera the background blur becomes stronger even without portrait mode in case of a dslr it's even stronger but then you can't go too close to a subject most cameras tend to lose focus in that first 5 to 10 cm range from the camera for that you need a macro lens or an attachment to an existing lens there are some cool accessories that let you capture these kind of pictures on your smartphone I actually made a video on that accessory. Here's the link. Watch it if you're interested. Let's now talk about white balance. It's just a parameter that helps in making the colors of a scene more natural. For example, here are two different pictures shot in different white balance settings. This is how the scene actually was when I shot the picture. This one doesn't look accurate. It's cooler. Similarly, if you're shooting sunset pictures, it's supposed to be warm. Warm as in orangish. This is a terrible representation of sunset. So what we need to do is adjust the white balance settings, see at which value the image looks good and click it. These days on most phones white balance is set to auto mode and it does a great job. In case the camera becomes weird and messes up the colors, then you should be able to find a button with some presets on the main screen of the camera app. Pixel size. The name says it all. It's the size of an individual pixel measured in microns. For a given sensor, less number of pixels means the individual pixel size is large, and high pixel count means the individual pixel size is small. That's why these days big brands like Apple and Samsung don't come up with ultra high resolution cameras like 16, 20, or 30, 40 megapixel cameras on their flagships because they give importance to the pixel size. Why? Simple. Large pixel size means it can capture more light, which helps a lot in low light. Mate 20 Pro has a 40 megapixel camera, but it still performs well under low light. How is that? Well, it doesn't exactly capture low light images at 40 megapixels. The phone combines four neighboring pixels into one, so effectively it's just 10 megapixels. Of course, it's not the same as a native 10 megapixel sensor, but but still, it does make a little bit of difference. Saturation. another term that we hear very often it's the intensity of colors it's basically how colorful a color is the strength of the tone let's say i capture this thing this image represents the red accurately means the saturation is perfect but this is oversaturated and this is undersaturated zero saturation means it's a black and white image so We are done with all the major terms. Let's now quickly go through some minor, not too important terms like bokeh or bokeh. I don't know the exact pronunciation. 
When you shoot something that's not too far away from the camera at a very wide aperture, then the background is blurred out. This is something we already spoke about. If there are lights in the background, they tend to appear like this, circular light balls. That's called bokeh, bokeh, whatever. Next, aspect ratio. It's nothing but the ratio of the width of an image to the height of an image. Most smartphone cameras click pictures at 4 is to 3 aspect ratio. Now an important fact here, some people think changing the aspect ratio to 16 is to 9 on their phones will capture a wider scene. But no, what really happens is the 4 is to 3 picture is cropped at the top and bottom which results in a 16 is to 9 picture. So if your phone has a 4 is to 3 sensor, then always stick to 4 is to 3 aspect ratio. If you want, you can crop later. Viewfinder. It's this little thing that you look into to have a look at the scene before clicking the picture. On a smartphone, the display itself could be considered as the viewfinder. Next, shutter release. You don't hear it often these days, but still, it's the thing that triggers the shutter to open up. Okay, simply put, it is this button or this one in case of a professional camera. Exposure compensation. Remember I told you we need to adjust shutter speed, aperture and ISO depending on what kind of a picture we need. Like widen the aperture if we want strong background blur, uh, decrease the shutter speed to reduce camera shake and so on. But if you don't care about all that, if you just want to brighten or darken the scene, just change the exposure compensation value or EV. There's a dedicated knob for that on most professional cameras. On smartphones, we just need to use that slider, which pops up when we tap to focus. FPS or frames per second. Once again, it would take an entire video to completely explain FPS, but here's the short version. A video is made up of multiple photos. The photos are called as frames here. So in a 60 FPS video, every second has 60 images. In a 30 FPS video, there are 30 images displaying every second. As the number of frames goes up, the video looks smoother. But for regular usage, the most common values are 24 FPS, 30 FPS and 60 FPS. I think with that, I've covered almost everything. If you got any doubts or queries, feel free to let me know in the comment section. I've put so much effort into the making of this video, so I want everybody to uh, feel satisfied like I want you guys to feel you you guys have learned something from this I'll reply with an explanation to whichever comment you post I also have an Instagram account dedicated for smartphone photography so if it's not too much of a hassle follow me there uh, here here I'm sorry <laughs> and guys in the history of my existence on YouTube this is the longest video I've ever done so if you appreciate the efforts, uh, kindly hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to Technology Jock for more videos like this and hit the bell icon to get notifications for my future videos. If you are still here watching this, it's been like what 10-15 minutes since the video started. Thank you so much. I'm really really grateful to you. I really hope you have a wonderful day. Bye.